Hello and welcome back. So I'm going to be doing another podcast style video tonight with uh, Goto808. He's known as my editor. Otherwise, say hello, Goto. Hey, everyone. And I'm also joined by the Mad Belmont, formerly known as the Madman2170. Yo, what's up? So tonight we're going to be discussing uh, esports and if they're actually healthy for the competitive side of gaming. What are you two thoughts on this? I'll let Mad Belmont start on this one, because I have my own opinion. Okay, so for me, I think it definitely does. It has its pros and its cons, right? It does keep the competitive spirit alive, especially if the developer supports that scene, like some have. There are some games that have been uh, active competitively for a decade, even more in some cases. So Free Fighter uh, 3, for thing? example. Yep. So, it can be healthy, but it can also hurt a game, because if developers decide to prioritize the competitive side a little bit too much, and the casuals get pushed out, you see... And like we were discussing in the last podcast episode, Dead or Alive 6, it tried to kind of do this weird middle ground where they were trying to really bring in the esports guys while also making it very accessible to casuals. And it just didn't work. So I'm going to chime in on my opinion on this one. And I Go am 100% in line with Mad Men on this one. Um uh, for those who do not know, I actually used to be a co-owner of a esports team uh, that has been dissolved right now. Um, we were mostly concentrated on Rainbow Six Siege, Call of Duty, shooter games. Um, mm. Being what Madman said, that things were 100% oriented for the Pro League. Oh, okay, pros are yelling at us for uh oh this weapon is too overpowered let's nerf it but then the casual players who adored that because they can't control it or they can't use it properly like the pros do they get nerfed they get knocked down and when they give their reports because ubisoft always gives their reports quarterly saying oh this is what we've seen on pros and uh high-ranking players well, now you're pushing out the lower-ranking players, and you're not allowing them to evolve from a game that's been alive since 2015. It is currently dying out, and it hurts me to say this, but Ubisoft should have paid more attention to the casual players instead of the pro players on this one. Mm. Yeah. And I actually agree with, well, both of you guys, so I don't really have much of a debate on this particular topic, but I think it's definitely one that's worth discussing uh, because, you know, that's kind of what killed Dead or Alive 6 for me, at least in part, because it tried to focus too hard on the esports side of things and was very light on the single player side. I, at the time, was very much into the single player side of fighting games, and it's only in recent years specifically the last year that I've gotten into the very competitive side of things because, well, I finally have people to play with. Well, I mean, I'm happy to jump in with you guys on fighting games. I am 100% not with a fighting game mentality. Uh, the only true fighting game I've played since I was young was Mortal Kombat, and even that has gotten a lot of attraction on sort of an esports-style competition. But what I love about Mortal Kombat is they don't need to listen to people like, oh, uh, we liked it better when it was weapons and all that. No, they said, okay, we did one with weapons and now we're back to normal because that was just horrible to code in. We like it simple. We like how the game was. Let's keep it simple, right? Which uh, Mortal Kombat had the uh, weapons because I am very new to the series, so you'll have to fill me in a little bit. If I remember correctly, it was Mortal Kombat Deception. Uh, Madman, you might want to chime in on this one. I am not 100% sure. Yeah, it sure. was one 
one of the PS2 games. I believe it was Deception. It may have been Deadly Alliance. I'm not too sure about that. I know Armageddon did uh, had no weapons whatsoever. Uh, yeah, I believe it was Deception. I'm going to be looking that up right now. Yes, it was Deception. I, I thought. You got to it just before I was able to say it, so... Yay, faster typing skills on Goto's part. Yay. <laughs> Actually, phone. Fair enough. Phone's always ready beside me, so... Either way, you typed it, sort of. Just faster fingers. It's easier. MK, deception. Gotcha. Um, so, you're very versed in the Mortal Kombat games. Uh, I'm not. Which ones are your favorites? And which ones do you think have the best competitive scene? So, for me, kind of a stupid, easy choice, but uh, I absolutely loved, uh, I don't remember exactly which one it was, but it was the first game where you had the Shaolin Path, where you could literally go stage to stage, level up your character, and learn everybody's combat moves to unlock more people, unlock more stuff for the crypt, and basically just unlock more stuff by just doing a small sort of side story mode. I think it was Shaolin Monks, but... That I, would be Shaolin Monks. There were two of them, if I remember correctly. Yes, one of them was an open-ish world, which I did not like, and the other one was a literal round fighter, which was awesome. Awesome. That that actually sounds really interesting. Also, Goto, tell us more about your experience as a um, esports team leader. So, being in an esports team is, for one, a very big hassle. Because you have to think of... It, it's a whole... Not pyramid scheme, but like you have the head of the team, then the co's, then the managers than the CFOs or those who will be in charge of money those who will be in charge of media those who will be in charge of editing recruiting uh, planning vacation trips well not vacation trips but like book the plane the the tickets for the hotels the everything and uh, seriously during the lapse of time I took care of this pro team uh, my wife got so mad at me that she says, I feel married to a cell phone. Which oh. gives you a little bit of an idea of how absorbed I had to be just to keep up with the team that's been moving around to Sydney, Australia, that's been going to France, Germany. Like, I didn't even get to go anywhere. I was stuck here at home. But working on my cell phone, on my PC, on everything, just trying to get everything sorted out i had a wonderful team with me i can't stress that enough the team helped me so much just to keep everything afloat but at one part head went off i went off a bunch of other staff went off and we were like okay the way this is going we can't keep this up we have families we have lives we can't manage these guys alone we need more people and we just got shared on, so we're like, nope, that's it. Hanging it up. Done. If you were to start another esports team, what sort of lessons would you take from your past experience to make it more efficient? I would definitely start off by building the core staff team. Then doing player tryouts. Those that we know that will not drop us, because we had, we had a team ready. And within the first week of signing up for a pro-am competition, two of them dropped out and they said, oh, we got other stuff, or oh, uh, no, not interested anymore, so no, we're not doing anything. So I can only imagine the words that were coming out of your mouth that period oh, of time. They were very colorful, I can guarantee you that much. Let me guess, in French, correct? Uh, yeah. Yeah, part of it. Uh, although I do talk more in English, that time I was 100% French. 
You know, I've always wondered, do you think more French or English? I can't even tell you. It's 50-50. Do you ever find yourself starting a sentence in one language and then switching to the other midway through? 100%. Happens to me every single day at work. I bet that's an interesting happens... experience for your co-workers. Yep. It happens almost all the time in party chat. <laughs> Well, well, actually, most of that is because I'm talking to you guys, and then I'm switching over to Canix, and I'm switching back to you guys, and then I'm just like, okay, I go to Canix in English, and then I go back to you guys in French, and I'm like, wait, no, other way around, dumbass. <laughs> it's almost like that, not that way, dumbass clip that I've got on my Twitch, right? Yep. Not that way, dumbass. <laughs> yep. <laughs> And Please, that, start that, that in the... editing, by the way, because that... Yes, it will be edited in. 100%. Perfect. Uh, so, by the way, I'm uh, curious. I'm actually no, going to go highlight ahead. this. This is the first time I actually have a podcast with you, knowing that I'm actually going to be editing this video tomorrow or later on today. Which is definitely an interesting thought experiment, isn't it? I'm going to hate yeah. hearing myself again, over and over and over again. Because I do have to rewatch a video like ten times just to be safe that everything is up to speed. I absolutely hate hearing my own voice, but since upgrading to my HyperX Quadcast S, I actually don't mind hearing myself so much. See, I actually have a good mic. I have a Razer Siren. I still can't hear myself. I, I'm just like, no, I hate my voice. I tolerate my voice now, and I think Madman can kind of attest to... Well, he's had to edit his own video, so he can kind of share his experience with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like, I hate hearing my own voice, but I gotta do it just because, like, you know, I got a video to edit, so you gotta, you know, you gotta hear yourself, moron. Yeah. <laughs> do you find yourself liking your voice better now that you actually have a good mic, though? It's a little more tolerable still gets on my nerves because I'm just like oh god every time I start an edit oh I can attest to that because I used to have to edit my own audio when I was doing radio stuff and that was not fun because I was cringing at my voice see um I actually <laughs> I'm dreading this because I downloaded my 24 hour stream or actually 27 hour stream of Tsushima I'm going to have to go did... through that. I haven't started. I've been... How did the 24-hour stream itself go, though? Uh, I had to quit both of them a little earlier due to one tech issue and the other one being a animal issue. Your cat breaking your his leg, right? Nope. That was uh, my old cat back then. Ah. Yeah. Old cat had a... Uh... A stroke, so had to cut everything. That definitely sucks. Uh, yeah. So, I'm curious. Would you want to start a esports team with me and the Mad Belmont, or mm, do you think that it's more fun to just like keep it kind of casual between the three of us? I think it's more fun to just uh, keep it casual because I'm telling you right now. As someone who has competed in esports, you have to have a whole fucking mentality. Like, a whole mentality. Because I played Call of Duty competitively. And I had to be on that game eight hours a fucking day just to keep up with my teammates, let alone my opponents. Basically, esports kind of kills the fun of the game, doesn't it? Uh, uh, I'll be honest, on, on my end, it did not kill the game, because I'm still on Rainbow Six Siege a lot. But it did suck the fun out of it during those work hours, because I had to guide the whole team on how, okay, if you're doing this, the enemy starts doing this, you're going to need to go through this side instead of flanking on the other side, because they're going to be awaiting for that. So if you're going through the third side, they're not going to be waiting, and you're going to flank twice as much people before you get dropped down. So Basically, you have to become a teacher of the game. 
Yeah. Well, that's that was my position. Uh, Belmont, I'm pretty sure, since he was competing, he was getting taught or more of him spreading more of his knowledge to his teammates. But that's... I was both getting taught and teaching at the same time, but it was mostly getting taught. Okay. And I was mostly getting taught the wrong way to play the fucking game because my coach at the time was so stupid. He basically wanted us to crawl across the damn map yeah. in Call of Duty. And yeah, that that don't work. No, it You've doesn't. You got time limits to work. Uh, you got time limits to take care of. Every time I'd, you know, pick up the pace, do what I normally do in public matches, I get chewed out for it. Basically. Uh, Why did they want you crawling? Uh, because my team at the time, who is now dissolved, like uh, Godo's team, uh. They wanted me, they hired a coach that was absolute shit, said he worked for FaZe, I didn't buy that at all. Uh, I see. You look at FaZe members, they are some of the quickest movie motherfuckers in that game. Yeah, just look at Fabian. I'll be honest, I don't really know the particular team and players that you mentioned, but I'm assuming that they're probably the top tier ones or close uh, to it. Phase was Faze actually one of the uh, pro teams. Phase Faze was actually top COD I think four years in a row before starting to get dethroned by other teams. Mm. Like Optic? Yeah. But again, it was a hard fought battle between those two teams. Now, if you're looking on the more strategic side of Rainbow Six Siege, the meta has changed so much from the game launch. At first, it was slow, methodic, clear, and then secure. Now, it's rush meta, which is stupid. You will never, in a tactical situation, and trust me, I should know, I have a military background, run into a occupied site and just I'm killing everybody. Why do you think the meta of Siege has shifted so much from being very realistic to very much similar to Call of Duty? They listened to the pros. Pros were saying, oh, it's taking two longs per match. Oh, it's a uh, little too hard to do certain things. Oh, well, okay, let's cut certain things, let's go quicker, let's up the speeds. I mean, back in 2015, Montang, which was one of the slowest players, which is actually odd to say, but him, Extended Shield, is now as quick as Ash, which is a three-speed operator that is top tiered for speed and mm -hmm. she can bolt into objectives very quickly but she somehow got slowed down to the 2015 montang speed which is a one speed operator which is odd. that seems odd very odd in fact um this kind of brings me to a point that i think is an interesting discussion idea anyways um have it so that you can more customize the game experience but have it be like you can play within certain metas think of it like a trading card game format because i'll just use Yu-Gi-Oh for example one of the earliest examples of a meta game was summon skull beatdown and then slowly it evolved into goat format which was more of a control format and then it kind of evolved into other things like teledad and where the meta is today but here's the thing. Most game companies don't let you play previous metas. What if that became a thing where game developers, card game developers, etc. just decided, you know what? Play, you can play these formats and you can, comp you can play them on a competitive ladder. See, and now actually, uh, Mad Men can attest to that. Uh, Ubisoft actually did something like that. Um, 
think it was last year, they did something called the Legacy Mode, which is we're reverting every single player back to Year 1, Season 1 loadouts. People with very broken weapons, with very broken optics, were enabled again. Uh, the maps were like they were back then. Uh, like, everything was back to the classic Rainbow Six Siege that we knew. And I went nuts. I was happy. Until I got to... We call him, and this is a meme, but the Lord which is Tachenka, a Russian operator, who, back when he got released, had a giant light machine gun. And that thing would... You would hear it, and you would be afraid. It had a bulletproof shield up front, and it would just chew out everything. That, that didn't sounds make... exactly like the Wraith in Resistance uh, 2 which had to go through multiple nerfings throughout that game's competitive lifespan. Well, see, what happened is he never actually got an actual nerf until they decided, okay, while well, his LMG, or light machine gun, is no longer a stationary object, he now has it in his hands. He can run around with it. It's his main weapon. And that got people scared. They were like, okay, that thing is a chunker. It will kill you in like two bullets. But what's going to be his special? Oh, they decided, oh, let's make it a fire napalm grenade launcher called a Shumika. Worst, worst thing I've ever seen. It Nobody uses it except for like a small entry denial. And even then, it's a fail. Okay, Go into more detail, because you got me interested. Uh, the Shumika is basically just an automatic drum-fed grenade launcher that bursts into flame when it impacts the floor and stays on fire for four to six seconds. During that, that time... That sounds pretty powerful. During that time, though, players can run through the fire and get no more than 20 to 40 damage going through fire why why is it so low because it has not been adapted to the new health system where people that are three armor have 125 hp instead of the uh original 100 hp plus resistance to bullets and not bullets and fire okay so that kind of backfired on them might come into a different update. Who knows? They're still toying around with the idea of the health system. And mm -hmm. I'll be honest, the health system is not a bad idea. It, it did at least alleviate the, okay, this person has a this armor rating. Why am I dying so fast? Oh, well, it's because my damage resistance is only 5% higher than the no armor operator. Okay. By that... the way, I'm curious if uh, Ubisoft was to put you in charge of controlling the meta for a year in Rainbow Six Siege, what are some changes you would make? Um, I would definitely revert to the year one run out being just you run out, you are you are detected directly and you might die like within a second because... Well, actually, you had three seconds when you ran out. And if you did not go back inside the first year, when it was in alpha or beta stage, I don't remember, uh, mm -hmm. you would get shot by a enemy sniper or overwatch. So the enemies were forced to stay inside and literally use any cover possible to aim outside and shoot people. But the other way around is possible as well. Attackers could literally hide in a bush and look at you and see your face go in front of window and shoot you. And you'd be like, oh, well, I shouldn't be running in front of window. Which would definitely lead to more assault from some of the more competitive players, I imagine. Definitely, but right now the meta is literally, uh, okay, they're pushing on 
I'm going to say this. Uh, there's a map called Canal, which has two sky bridge, which is two buildings that are linked by two bridges. People okay. will impact grenade a doorway when you're a defender, run outside and flank the attackers while the attackers are trying to push into an objective, which leaves them a hundred percent open. So what they what they did to fix it is they added people with claymores. But instead of just having one claymore, they have two. So okay. I will instead of impacting a door and then running out, I will strip the door impact the ground to take care of all the two or more claymores and run out. Okay, so because I don't play Rainbow Six Siege, you're going to have to tell me what the claymores are in this game, because when I think claymore, I think uh, big Scottish broadsword. <laughs> uh, the claymores are actually... Uh, they're laser-triggered explosive device that if a beam is cut it will explode and kill the player that is on the other side. Uh, thing is, those Claymore only trigger on enemies, not allies. So allies will go through it, doesn't matter. Just like any defensive gadgets that are applied by the defensive team will not be triggered on a defensive player, but will trigger on a offensive player. Okay. Claymores are in Call of Duty as well. You yeah. can actually equip them as one of your... Uh, <clears throat> you can actually replace your grenades with them if you want to. And what a lot of players in Call of Duty like to do is, if they're camping, they will find a power spot, put the claymore right by a door so that when an enemy walks through the door, bam, they get... Uh, Destroyed. ...by the claymore. Okay. And this kind of brings me to another thought process it's i'm gonna shift it back into fighting games for a bit if yep. you guys don't mind yeah go ahead uh, why do you think it is that uh esports heavily work well for shooters but they don't seem to work well when it comes to fighting games on my opinion on this one is actually uh shooters are very easily adaptable and they do tend to have a lot of a team versus team mentality while a fighting game for me is a 1v1 competition and mm -hmm. I mean a 1v1 I could do this literally from anywhere in the world against anyone in the world and that would be it not much of a big thing watching an esports on shooting games like that just captivates me because I have two teams that I can watch and be like okay the same is pushing this way, but these guys are doing this thing. Oh, okay. I've never thought of doing this sort of maneuver to help me capture this area. Ah, learn. So it basically helps you learn a different approach to the game that you otherwise would never have considered. Yeah, basically yeah. the esports yeah. taught me a little bit more of a game that I absolutely love. I've been a Rainbow Six Siege player since 2015, and even... When the game was in beta, I mean, that's dedication, if I do say so myself, because we're now in year seven of the game, and I'm still there. Yeah, that is, that is definitely dedication, and I wouldn't be surprised if you're at least an above average player because of that. Well, Mamma can attest to my skill set. Uh, I do tend to... What thirsty son of a bitch this one is. <laughs> I, I tend to be an entry fragger, so I am the first one in, try to kill as much people as possible, and then get out. Okay. Yep. He carries. He carries. He's always top of the leaderboard. Yeah, not, not anymore. Almost always. Not anymore. Almost always. They, they changed the gun recoil. That, that screwed me over. Mm. So I why do you think it is... Where I go off, but... Go ahead. Uh, oh, I was just saying, I do have my games where I pop off. Like, uh, there was one game where we were playing in a quick match. It was known as casual mode at the time. And I went 13-3 and three that game, and we still lost. Yep, on tower. I remember. That's where you had the two flicks on Frost and Mozzie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he got team killed for it. That seems like it would have been a very exciting match to watch. 
it i'll be honest like that's probably one of the next games i want to restart streaming it's rainbow six siege i've loved the game i've always loved the game and i miss playing it i've been out of time so much lately that i i just don't even know if i can stream anymore <laughs> that makes sense i mean hopefully you can get back to it because you are a great streamer uh, I mean, uh, just looking at right now, Lever. I got home. Well, here, my day today was get up at five fifty, leave for work at six twenty-five, get home from work at four fifteen, four thirty, eat, wash up, do the laundry, get stuff ready for usually the next day. But today uh, it's Friday, so not doing much. Mm -hmm. but still had to do the laundry and all that. And then what did I do? I went out, edited edits, and then uh, voiceovers, audio editing, uh, and it leads us to, right now, 11.53 p.m., almost midnight, doing a podcast. My I do apologize that I have put extra work on your table hey, don't worry about it uh i actually took the word voluntarily uh but see it's already eleven fifty three p.m friday we're all heading up to saturday and i mean what did i do today i worked cleaned and worked <laughs> at least one form of work was enjoyable though right that is, that is true yes actually um I'll, I'll be honest. I had fun during my physical training this morning because we had we were playing soccer with our higher ups, and I managed to have a lot of fun. Soccer is always fun. It is. Or football, as my European friends will say, because that is actually my preference for calling it. Uh, nomenclature wise, I'll 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 be a hundred percent honest. It does make sense football because you only do use your feet. Whereas football, as the Americans call it should be called hand egg that sounds wrong no <laughs> <laughs> i was trying to make a joke to see if i could get the madman to go off because i know he's a big football fan if it's called hand egg then what do fucking kickers do <laughs> <laughs> well i was going more off the fact that you know, you carry it most of the time, and it's egg-shaped. Yeah. All right, so, Matt Belmont, what is your uh, your thoughts on fighters, and why is it not much of a esports oriented game setup? I think it's just because there's so many things to adapt in a fighting game, as opposed to a shooter. A shooter, you know, you change a gun, there's plenty of other guns to replace it, see. But... You nerf a character in a fighting game, and all those people that played that character have to go and look for other characters now because their character got shit on. I can very much attest to that because Hitomi, who is my favorite in Dead or Alive, got completely destroyed in Dead or Alive 6. She was never that competitively viable in 5, like decently so, but you wouldn't see her in the top cut of tournaments, if you know what I mean. Oh, yeah. But with Dead or Alive 6, I don't have a character that I can really call my own anymore. See, I, I find that sucks. I, I know they're trying to cater to the new players and trying to attract new people. But, like, if you're willing to destroy what you've built or destroy the community you've already created, then what the heck are you doing calling it the same franchise? Name it something else. Make it something new. Which actually is something that I think is a big problem in the gaming industry. There are just, like, so many games that they have changed so much from what they used to be that they they don't feel like the same franchise anymore. And we have a absolute trough of new IPs at this point in gaming. Have you guys not noticed that? Oh, I, I've noticed I mean, 
how many new IPs can you think of that came out on the PS4 generation? There's very few, in fact, I would say. Yeah. There's Bloodstained a couple that tried. Bloodstained was a great... Actually, it still is great. Uh, still waiting on that multiplayer roadmap, though. There was going to be a multi multiplayer for Bloodstained? Yep. Yeah, there's a co-op mode coming. It's supposed that to be... Is... Probably when I'm going to be out and born. That sounds really freaking cool. But uh, um, I, I'm actually going to chime in on this. So I do understand there's less and less new special IPs coming out and all that. Because, you know, people are like, oh, well, this has been done and this has been done. Mm -hmm. What's stopping you from creating a new game from an old idea? Look at Conker's Bad Fur Day. That, that game is one of my favorite. That I've never got to experience it. I do want to, but from what I've seen of it, that is so my kind of game because my friend was telling me about it when I was like 18 and I'd never heard of it at that point in time. And he sent me the giant singing poo. Oh. And I was just like, yep, I'm sold. The great mighty poo. Actually, I have original n64 cartridge right beside me in my n64 i have i have the rare replay on my xbox one see actually that's another thing and this pisses me off a hundred percent so first original conquerors bad fur day on n64 censorship none they did not care they would say fuck they would go bitch they didn't care the Rare Replay, or the Live and Reloaded version of the game, has been so censored that even saying Chocolate Starfish was bleeped out. And that's not even that bad. No. And I'm like, okay, this game, originally from the N64 era, literally the first ever Nintendo published licensed game... That was not just -rated. mature only rated, because it was 17 plus on the box. Uh, like, how how did it go from being that masterpiece of in your face, this is what real life is, kids, live with it, to a somewhat okay teenager rated game like it, it is at most a teen rated madman correct me on this but i think the live and reloaded one is rated t oh uh, let me see here. i'm yeah, looking I it up no nope, and... nope nope it's rated m as well it's rated m as well but I don't know. Uh, it doesn't feel it mature. It was heavily censored compared to the original. Uh, the yeah. closest thing to the original is this Rare Replay version, and then there's still fucking cuss words that are uh, bleeped out in that version. Yeah, because it, it's actually part of the Live and Reloaded. <laughs> mm. So, But uh, uh, since we're talking about raunchy platformers, I'm actually going to promote something that I'm going to start next month. Ooh, what you going to be doing? I'm going to be playing Hellpie on my streams. Hmm. I do not know Halpai. Uh it is an indie platformer that just released last month. And hmm. basically you play as the demon of demon of bad taste. His name is Nathan. <laughs> okay. And he has a pet cherub who is named Nugget and Nugget is a massively overweight cupid is the best way I can describe it and it has a South Park style of humor. And oh. the whole goal of the storyline is to make Satan a uh, birthday cake. Oh, okay. That's that's actually pretty weird. Uh, I'll be yep. honest, though. I, I still remember on N64, and this was another rare occasion where, I don't know, Nintendo f flipped the lid and just went, we're publishing this game. South Park. Literally a South Park shooter adventure game. I on... vaguely remember that game. I, I remember it because I played with my brother and he kept on getting the cow launcher and having my head 
up a cow's ass. <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm actually. You know what I think would be a really fun uh, game in the esports scene if they did a first-person shooter with completely wacky weapons that had a completely goofy tone, where everything is just massively overpowered. I would love to see that, honestly. That would that would be a great game idea. Again, that would be an awesome new IP, because I don't think anybody has done anything like that. The closest I can think of is Resistance as a series. Yeah, but and even... even that... Though, you know what's crazy? Ratchet and Clank, they actually tried to get a competitive mode going on the PS2 era. Yeah, I, I remember and you that. Know what? With the, the third game. If no, I not, not just the third game. As far back as the second game, there was actually online play competitive. Oh, I did not know that. Yeah, and the thing is, that was a staple for the remainder of the Ratchet and Clank PS2 era. But I, for I'm, whatever reason, it never took off, but Halo did. I'm going to chime in on that, because you're talking about shooters and newly sort of adapted games like that. Metroid... Two Echoes, Metro Prime 2 Echoes, was their first IP to have a multiplayer game tied back into it, where you could have four people fighting it out, and their idea was to have uh, the GameCube system link cable to be able to daisy chain your GameCubes and have a competition on said game. That never that took sound, off. That sounds so cool, but you know what? I honestly would love it if a Ratchet competitive mode came back, because think about it. That's very niche. They're, Ratchet's all about crazy weapons. True. And you know what? PlayStation doesn't really, at this point in time, have a shooter franchise that's their own that's very competitive. Sure, Ratchet's a third-person shooter, but imagine you take kind of the ideas from the old game's competitive modes... You incorporate some more platforming. You incorporate some of the ideas of the Uncharted multiplayer because that was fun because it incorporated parkour into the competitive side. Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay, I was about to mention fucking Uncharted because I got into Uncharted 2 and 3's multiplayer modes back at the tail end of the PS3, and I dabbled in Uncharted uh Four's multiplayer. Oh my god, those were so much fun. The only, exactly. The only experience I got with the Uncharted ones were from videos I was watching on YouTube of people fooling around and always going slow motion, diving and shooting, and it was just, what the hell's going on? But it was hilarious, and it was funny to see, because every time someone would dive into a slow motion shooting bit... Everybody mm -hmm. would go slow-mo. So you could be having a very intense firefight. And as you're trying to correct an aim or something, you'd have someone do a slow-motion dive to do something stupid. And you would suddenly go slow-mo fighting someone else. And you're like, what the hell? Who's doing this? It was and you know what? funny. The, the only shooters that I've ever been able to get into competitively were... Resistance 2 and the Uncharted ones. That's it. Those are the only ones that have really drawn me in. Hmm. But you know, I'm I'm willing to bet that if you would give Rainbow Six Siege a try, you might like it. I am very much willing to give it a shot. I just don't have access to the game. Yeah. Well, the game is... I mean, it usually goes on sale and for like 20 bucks for the starter pack that's a pretty good deal actually and it also has uh free weekends yeah it has a lot of free weekends often. when when it <laughs> whenever the new seasons come out it's like oh free weekend that's pretty cool uh, i i will give kudos on uh ubisoft for this literally going oh uh new season new uh, year, whatever. Free. Have fun. Like, mm -hmm. that's pretty badass on their part to just go, have fun, guys. Which kind of brings me back to the fighter side of things again. Sorry for jumping topics, but... Hey, no worries. Um, 
that's one thing that Dead or Alive actually does remarkably well because of the core fighters. All you really need is PlayStation Plus. Yeah. Well, actually, um, that kind of ties into what Ubisoft did back in year three, I believe, for Rainbow oh, yeah? Six Siege. Yeah, they, they made the game. Uh, you had to have PS Plus. Uh, you had a week, the game free with, uh, all the operators. And then if you decided to keep playing after said week, yes, you would lose your operators, but you would keep the main 10 operators. Main 10, explain. Uh, so when the game launched, there was 10 basic operators. That was like okay. five attackers, five defenders. These are everybody in the game. 5v5. Have fun. Nice. Uh, there, there was more, but I just... I said 10 because that's all my brain can think of right now. I'm kind of a little tired. That's fine. Um, but it was like, here's the basic operators. You want to get your other characters? Play the game. Get some points. By the operators. That's it. Mm -hmm. And that's... that's a pretty good system, really. And I'm surprised that m more games don't kind of do that. I'm actually surprised, too, because it draws in a lot of people. And, I mean, sure, at first you do not make a lot of money, but microtransaction will get you there. Mm -hmm. Ubisoft... Except since... for me! <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> you and me, Madman. Um... Actually, since the start of Rainbow Six Siege, and I know I talk a lot about it, but that's my main game. Um, they started off by doing, oh, you want the next season a week earlier than everybody else? Then, hey, pay up, uh, like, I think it was like 10 bucks back then, and you would get the new operator, you would get a bunch of different perks earlier than everybody else. And then they started seeing, oh, well, the people that are buying the new operators are getting locked out by the other people. So let's make it so that um, you buy the new operator. It's like for sure you're going to get it because you cannot select it more than once per game. Mm -hmm. So that was cool. They scrapped that. Now it's back to free for all. But again, now they're at like what? I think. 20 30 20 30 operators per sides yeah so, it's so, around 25 to 30 operators a side yeah so a pretty decent roster size really 100 percent. and this actually goes back to what uh, surprises me 100 percent. their main goal when they created this game was to have a hundred operator so 50 attackers 50 defenders do you think they'll reach that? They're still pushing for it. They, they said it in the last season update. Their main goal has not shifted. It is still 100 operators to be cleared before the game is set to die. Mm -hmm. So they're not that far off. They used to do two operators per season, and now they're down to one. Because they're doing a lot of tech issues and trying to ban as much cheaters as possible. And, I mean, that's another thing, like, I'm furious about is cheaters in esports-styled games. My god. What do you think can be done to curtail that a little bit more? So, back before the pandemic, esports were, okay... Everybody gets into this giant arena, plugged into the company PCs, and they are fighting on a LAN network. <clears throat> There's no way that you can cheat. Absolutely none. Mm -hmm. For some reason, after the pandemic, like the pandemic, it's not done, but it's slowed down. Yep. They're still doing at distance competitions. Where people from other side of the world can be like, oh, well, I'm just going to plug in these cheats 
and do what the hell I want to. These guys, those that are doing that, they ruin esports for so many people. It pisses me off at the highest point. And for those mm -hmm. who, and this is a message at large, for those who think that cheating is not easily detectable or it's very easy to get away with, think again. There's a lot of people that are working on anti-cheats and other styles. And trust me, they will end up finding a way to counteract. There is one game that actually needs access to kernel level of your PC, which is the lowest basic entry form of information on your PC. And it scans it every single day that you are using your PC. And if they find that there is a kernel that has not been regulated or has been changed incorrectly, they uninstall the game or they block you from playing the game. Which game is that? Uh, that was... Um... It had a lot of backlash. Uh, I think it was one of the COD games. But I'm not sure. Can you confirm or deny that, Madman? Could have been CSGO as well. Uh, maybe. Because I don't... Uh, Call of Duty's mainly been... Uh, In-person lands. They've actually gone back to that in the past year. Uh, it did do online... But uh, to my knowledge, there wasn't any cheating in the CDL at that time. Okay. So, so here's actually, a quick question. Oh, go ahead. Go Apex. To... Apex. Apex does it. Yep. That's Apex, cool. Arma. There's actually uh, 13 pages of games that are currently using it. Could you link that in the description for when the video goes live? I've copied the link already. That's actually very interesting. I did not know that this many games actually used it. Huh. Even Battlefield uses it. Pretty neat. Hmm. So, what are some of the most positive experiences you guys have had on the esports side of things? Okay. For me, from the player's side... Just getting to know some of my teammates. I'm still actually in contact with one of them. Wookie, if you're seeing this, what's up, brother? <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, it's just the camaraderie that you build with your teammates. You know, I still love every single member of my team. From Wookie to fucking Call of Duty ABC to Pro Vamps to Symptoms and his fucking flexing on everybody. God, I miss that. <laughs> you know, that camaraderie is what I miss every single day, ever since I retired from pro from uh, amateur play. Not pro play. I wasn't a pro player, but I was an amateur player. Do you ever wish you'd gone pro? I know I could have if I had stuck with it, but life just got in the way. Fair enough. Uh, what about you, Goto? Some of your more uh, positive experiences uh, in the esports community? For me, it's the feeling of not really a family feeling, but more of a unity. Where if I had to talk with one of the members, everybody would just support what we were saying. If a member was to be disciplined because they did some very stupid, like, cheat. Mm -hmm. um, the whole team would back up and literally go, why did you do this? You know it was wrong. And they wouldn't necessarily be angry with the person. They would literally just, like, coax them to make them realize, I did a wrong thing. I need to correct my posture. I need to wake up, smell the coffee, and double down, get better, and just reintegrate this wonderful family sensibility or sentiment that I have with these guys that are just spending eight hours a day talking about how to do certain things, how to 
feel better about oneself. Because, I mean, talking about early esports, people thought esports were a bust. Thought that it was the stupidest thing ever. Competitions for video games. I always found it exceptionally wonderful. Not only is it that these guys are sacrificing hours upon hours a day to get better and, you know, be top dog. They're also pushing the limit of their own body just to be able to achieve this position. Mm -hmm. It's 100% like pro athletes that are doing marathons, that are doing the... 500 meter sprints that are long in jumps. the NHL that are in the NBA exactly. etc. They're they're pushing It's just a it's just a different methodology. Really. Exactly. They're pushing their body to the absolute limit to be top dog. And or to even be aver- above average really like it, yeah. Because let's face it a average esports uh player is going to be that much better than the plebs that are just playing it for fun. True. Um and I don't mean that negatively. That's just I I actually remember this one clip and it will be on the montage where I dropped down on canal again and madman literally said cuz he was with me on that one Phase, what the hell are you doing? Where's this guy's contract? Sign him up. Because he literally <laughs> dropped through a hatch, went around a corner, flick, headshot, flick, headshot, flick, headshot, literally sat there by the bomb, ate the plant, okay? He heard the dude coming in the hallway. He backed up, literally had the crosshair on the door... Okay, on the door as the dude was walking through, bam, headshot again. So it must have been like uh, Goto had gone, as I would call it, Matrix mode, which you've been on the receiving end many, many times, Madman, when I'm playing Sophidia. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, talking about Sophidia, that's going to be our stream tonight. Yep. Uh, you can find us at. I'll let you plug your Twitch, Goto. Twitch.tv slash Goto808. Mine's Twitch.tv slash Lever90. And let's have Belmont promote his. Mine is Twitch.tv slash The Mad Belmont. All right. And I've got like one more kind of question before we kind of wrap up because I feel like we are kind of getting near the end, anyways. Uh, the question is why do you think it is that because fighting games are esports? That there's no question about that. Why do you think it is that they're just as entertaining to watch as an esport as the shooters? And would you say that watching a fighting game esport is more like watching a tennis match because it's one versus one? I actually think it's more of a chess match. It's a one v one chess match between the two opponents. And just like Godel was saying earlier, how you can learn things about the game from watching uh, two pro teams in a shooter go up against each other, you can learn something by watching an entire tournament in fighting games because different people play different characters in different ways, so you can say, ooh, this character, I thought that they were only supposed to be played this way, but I'm watching this tournament and somebody's playing them in a whole a whole different style, a whole different mentality, and it's just it opens your mind to more mm. stuff. So it's like me with Athena, because mm. remember how much I threw and tilted John because of my playstyle with Athena? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I was using her as a hit-and-run character and not as a zoner like most people play her. Yeah. See, for me, and... um, combat and esports. I mean, I'm... I love combat. I love combat games. But I'm bad at them. 100% bad. Um, I feel that watching people, esports, combat combat games are just poetry in motion. 
they know the combos, they know the special moves by heart, and they will pull them off without any hesitation. It almost looks like it's a computer versus computer fighting each other, and it's special. Mm -hmm. Though it it aggravates me, it gets me angry, because I can't pull off anything like that. I am just... I'm the little kid in the corner spamming down and low kick until the game's over. <laughs> All right, so this will be the last question and then we'll wrap up. What do you think could be done to make fighting games better as both an esport and make them more accessible, more fun, and for the casual player to maybe boost themselves up to the esport level eventually? I'm actually going to go first on this one. And I want to bring back the same style as Tekken Tag Tournament. That was a hell of a game. That was fun, because what you could do is literally, through one game, oh, I died, but my buddy here with the controller for the second player is already up and running, ready to go. So he's already going for the, the same match. There's no pause, there's no KO, fade out, fade in, new character. No, no, no. New character jumps in, keeps on going, fast paced, let's go, let's get it going, let's get it done. That's actually remarkably similar to what uh, King of Fighters does if you do team tournament mode. See, I because, actually was una unaware of KOF doing yeah, that. Because, yeah, because what you do is, it would be me, you, Belmont as a team, hypothetically, John, Shinky, and, you know, someone else. Yeah on the other team then it would be you pick the order you select your best character in that particular game and then you duke it out okay and basically it goes boom snap next character right away basically there is a load screen but it's a very minimal one. Oh, see that's that's the thing though in tekken there was no load screen the other player would jump in your character would disappear and the other one would jump and be ready to fight right mm -hmm. there. No pause, no nothing. It was just go. See, I'm wondering if that might just be because of crossing between PS4 and PS5. Because I imagine if it's three PS5 players versus three PS5 players, I'm imagining no load times. Well, see, I, I, Tech and Tag was back in the PS1, PS2 eras, right? Like, it was transitioning. It was, it was, a, it was actually a launch game for the PlayStation 2. I know, but it, it was still in the PS1 end era, PS2 start era. And they yeah. managed to do it with no load screen. Why can't we do that nowadays? That is pretty impressive. So, Belmont, what would you do to make... Uh... It better on both the casual and the esports side of things for fighting games. Uh, did we cut out? Because I'm not hearing anything from anyone. Uh, I'm still here. Okay. So I guess since Belmont's gone off, I no, will. I, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> okay. Did you hear what my question was? Uh, no. I did not. Okay, I asked what you would do to make the esports and the casual side of fighting games better in the future. Uh, okay. Take the feedback from everybody. Don't just prioritize esports. Don't prioritize the casual. You don't want to alienate either one of them. Take feedback as a whole, and then make changes based off of that, okay? If you prioritize the esports side, you push the casuals away. If you put, if you try to go towards the casuals, guess what? Your esports scene suffers. So basically, you want to kind of aggregate the feedback of both of them and find a middle ground. Yes, please, find a middle ground, okay? Because I've seen too many fighting games go so one way or the other. Either they heavily prioritize the the hardcore player and they push Seek. the casuals off to other games, or they prioritize the casuals, <laughs> Marble Infinite, and then push the hardcore players away. 
okay, here's what I would personally do. I would definitely do that for like the main competitive scene, but my idea would be incorporate custom rule sets, make it so that you could do ranked matches with custom rule sets and then have tournaments based off those. That way you've got tournaments for the very, very casual, you got tournaments for the more intermediate like us, and then you've got tournaments for the very hardcore like Setsy. That's very what do you well think said. about it? I just think it's very well said. Uh, 100% agree. Um, I also agree with Matt Belmont's 50-50. Uh, uh, I on my on my behalf, I have to say, just don't take everything too seriously. If a pro team says, oh, well, this is buggy, but you get 90,000 other people saying, no, this is fine, don't touch it, don't listen to that little speck. Listen yeah, to definitely. the majority. The majority is what will make the game keep going. Majority rules. Basically. I mean, um, this is going back to Rainbow Six Siege. I, my current boss is a plat... Or, sorry, not plat. He is a Diamond 2 champion level player. He could have went esports, and he decided, I've got a wife, I've got a kid, I need to concentrate on that instead. Mm-hmm. He is still playing the game, but since their last update where pro players were like, oh, well, uh, we need uh, silencers to uh, work well, and we need the attachments for the weapon to work actually how they're supposed to be intended. That screwed everybody's aim, screwed everybody's perception of the game. And now the game is very, very hard to play. Like, I used to do, like Mad, Mad, Mad Belmont said games where I would pop off and almost do 15 to 20 kills, which is extraordinary, because this is a 5v5 situation, and you do mm -hmm. not respawn. Where, now I get games where I literally do 2 to 3 kills. It's and I'm the less... one that's double his kills, instead of it being like him quadrupling I... my kill count. Actually, my wife... Katnix has gotten games where she's gotten 10 kills because she's a trap operator. She's okay. mastered fucking Capcan's traps so much. Ugh, even I wouldn't want to go up against her. Nice. But So uh, is there... Oh, go ahead. Nope, that, that was pretty much it. I was actually going to segue into... What do you guys think? Uh, basically, what I've said my piece. Is there anything else that you guys want to say? No, I'm... I think I've said my piece. <laughs> I think I've given my two cents. All right. It's been wonderful doing a podcast with you guys. I hope that we can do it again really soon. Definitely. <coughs> yeah, uh, you guys can always pitch podcast ideas to me. That includes the comment section. We are more than happy to discuss most topics in the gaming industry. Actually, I will uh, segue into one of the next videos I want to record with you as soon as possible, and that is the history, evolution of fighting games since their creation as an arcade game to the now current 17th generation of fighting game. Yeah, I'm definitely down for that, and maybe we can get Belmont in on this and we can make it another two-way podcast definitely all right guys so that's been the podcast for tonight uh you can watch some of my previous videos uh goto will probably be incorporating a uh thumbnail As or whatever usual. it's called uh, i what will it, whatever do a thumbnail. it's oh i was talking about like the click here to watch oh, the video the end card that's, end card yes um to the previous podcast episode because yeah that feels like the most appropriate uh option you can follow my social media accounts uh for twitter and instagram it's leaver 90 ttv uh you can follow my twitch which is 
twitch.tv slash leafer90. And you can join my Discord. The links will be in the description below. Also, if you want to catch up with the Mad Belmont, I will have his socials below, and I will have Goto's socials below. Hire him if you want a really amazing editor. Yep, I will actually post my uh, editor email on screen just before we leave. Perfect. Have a great night. See you, everyone. Good night, everyone. <laughs>